Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. Today's guest is here to talk to us about the real differences between right and left. He's an economist, an author, and a professor of economics at George Mason University. His latest book is Voters as Mad Scientists. Brian Kaplan, welcome to the show. Very happy to be here on The Rational Egoist, since the subtitle of the new book is Essays on Political Irrationality. Glad to know that you're on the right side of this whole rationality question. <laughs> yeah, me too. All right. you. Your thesis is that the left hates markets and the right hates the left. So what do you mean by this? Yeah, hate is too strong. I, like, I prefer the word antipathy, a distaste, which could go all the way up to hatred or could just go down to, uh, but uh, it comes down to this. Uh, there's this question of what is it that all left-wing people have in common? What do all right-wing people, right people have in common? And I say, well, that's hard because there's always just going to be some weird people on each side who just don't fit in with anybody else. But I say, all right, well, how about we tone it down a bit? What if we just say, let's try to imagine a grand convention of all self-identified left-wing people on earth for the last 200 years. Imagine they're all in a room together and ask them to sign a consensus paper. And you need to get, say, 80% of the people in the room to sign it. What would be in the paper or the document or the statement produced by the left-wing convention? And I say they'd be able to agree on a bunch of complaints about markets. It wouldn't necessarily be, in fact, it would not be abolish the market, destroy it, kill all the capitalists or anything like that. It would be a bunch of complaints about markets. And I say if you do the similar one for all the groups that we think of as right-wing, Everyone from fascists and Nazis and Republicans and Christian Democrats and whatever other groups you can think of uh, who get classified as right wing, you know, have the you know, code, throw them all in there and say, you got to come up with a statement that 80 percent of you guys can agree on. I say what they would be able to agree on would be a bunch of complaints about the left. They would not be able to come up with a bunch of statements in favor of markets because there's a lot of right-wing people who have lots of complaints about markets, actually. They sure do. But they would all be able to say, God, the left, I just can't deal with those guys. Aren't they annoying? So why do you think this is the case? And I asked that in this context. I once read a book called The, the Great Debate, The Origins of Right and Left, I think it was called, something mm -hmm. like that. And it was about the origin stemming from the debate between Thomas Paine and Edmund Burke. And Thomas Paine wanted to change things. He was he believed in rights and he, he, you know, wanted to really mix things up where Edmund Burke wanted to maintain the old way. So if you look at it like that, does it make it, it might that be an explanation that the left wants to change things and the right hates him for wanting to change things? Right. It's a very popular story. Again, it's almost embodied in the word conservative suggesting and serve. I just say this is wrong. There are a lot of right wingers who want big changes there are plenty of left-wingers who think the world is, is basically okay the way that it is, although we've always got to tack on some complaints about markets, even in Sweden or something like that. We can't just say everything is fine the way it is. If you're a left-wing Swede, you got to say, except there's a market causing trouble and we <laughs> got to do more to regulate them. But yeah, like if you just think about fascism, it's a revolutionary movement, but also almost everyone classifies it right as right wing. Obviously there is a tendency for both left and right to say that the worst people in on their side are not even really on their side. So of course, plenty of leftists want to say, oh, uh, communists don't count as left wing, they're fake left wingers. And obviously plenty of right wingers want to say fascists don't count, no, they're not, they're actually part of the left. And what I say is, look, it's true that you could go and gerrymander the definition to get the bad guys out of your group, but it's not honest because you can just see that there is a continuum of I tolerate this guy who tolerates that guy who tolerates the next guy who tolerates the guy after that. And in that sense, you can see you are part of the same group. Or like alternately, another way of understanding who's really on your group is who are the people that are embarrassing and yet you still don't want to condemn them? <laughs> you know, so like, you know, like, like this is like a standard issue with you know, the Israelis trying to get peace with the Palestinians. There's a bunch of modest, moderate Palestinians, but the problem is even though they're moderate Palestinians, when some young Palestinian hotheads commit a terrorist attack, the moderates don't want to say, we unequivocally you know, like, like, you know, say that they are absolutely terrible. We're going to do everything we can, hunt them down, hand them over to the Israelis for execution. Like you now the moderates are like, well, look, I'm a moderate, but I understand those guys and where they're coming from. And that's a classic thing that 
you'll see in political movements in general, the your extremists, even though you might want to say they're not really with us, but you kind of find out when the extremists do something extreme, do you want to go and say with no apologies to destroy them? Or do you want to say, well, you have to understand <laughs> you want to do that. Okay. So it seems like in, in this explanation it seems like the left are more philosophically inclined more idea more ideologically mm -hmm. inclined whereas the right is just motivated by a dislike for the ideologies and philosophies of the left whatever they might be is that true and if so why like what what's happening here i mean there's something to that although you know, the first thing to remember is you got to distinguish between the rank and file and the intellectuals so like the intellectuals of every side are philosophically inclined to some degree. The rank and file of almost every movement is not philosophically inclined at all. So it's really sort of a question of how important are the philosophically minded people in different groups. I mean, I would say that among the, you know, among the left, you know, the, like, in, like the anti-market complaining, on the one hand, you know, like the, often there's some philosophy tacked on, but like ultimately like it's striking to me how even very smart leftists it does come down to, I just don't like what the markets are doing, rich people, corporate fat cats. And then you know, there's, you may add on some stuff on Hegelian metaphysics or whatever, but still for even the most intellectually sophisticated leftists to just say, Hey, uh, tell me something really good about markets and don't equivocate and don't tack on any additional complaint, please. Right. And it's just, just so hard. It's the same kind of thing where if you don't like a person, just say, hey, give some undiluted praise for this person you don't like. It's, it's not like, an easy oh, thing to do. I, want to. <laughs> I mean, that said, I would, you know, I mean, probably the best way of putting it is I would say that for the left, there is like a greater reverence for specific thinkers, you know, sort of the intellectual heroes. And for the right, there's less of that. There's more of like, 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 you know, appreciation for a broader tradition. Um, something that is that is uh, this actually shows a difference within the right rather than between left and right. But if you go to the Heritage Foundation in D.C., conservative think tank, who do you think that they've got pictures of on their walls? It's a whole bunch of portraits. Who do they put portraits on their walls? I would guess it's either one of two two groups of people. I would say perhaps they have the founding fathers up there. Mm -hmm. Or my other guess would be a bunch of libertarian economists. No, no, no. This is the Heritage Foundation. This is the Heritage Foundation. I know, but the conservatives tend to when it when it comes to their economics. That you know, and the the yeah. intellectual conservatives, they go to your Milton Friedmans or your Mises yeah. or Hayek, all not conservatives. Right. So actually, not correct. What they have on the walls of the Heritage Foundation are conservative politicians. Really? Yes, successful oh. conservative politicians. They oh wow! Reagan, I wouldn't have guessed Thatcher, that. People like that. When you go over the Cato Institute, that's where they've got. Founding fathers and libertarian intellectuals. <laughs> okay. But especially even among the founding fathers, they're sort of handpicked. There's no Alexander Hamilton portraits. I, I wouldn't guess there would libertarian be libertarian ones. So yeah. So basically among conservatives, the, the idea of conservative politicians are heroes, and among libertarians, it's libertarian intellectuals. Um, so that's we that's not really a left versus right difference. It's a difference within two different parts of what I would call the right wing. Again, I know that libertarians often reject being called right wing. But I would still say, eh, like, you know, like you, I understand that you don't like it, but again, by this broad standard of which group are you on the side of, I think you're still pretty clearly on the right. That's how you're generally seen. And it's not complete. It's not invented. There is a reason why you get put in there, even if you don't like it. Um, really? You would say that you would put libertarians on the right. See, I wouldn't <laughs> in, I mean, obviously you know whenever you deal with stuff like this you're painting with a broad brush yes of course so you know so everybody's not included but generally speaking libertarians are for ending the war on drugs for opening the borders up and in those things are certainly they're usually pro choice those things are certainly not right wing yes so again you know, I, I say you need to think about left and right as being tribes rather than bodies of ideas the ideas change over time and often don't really logically make all that much sense when you put them as a package. You know, like why is being pro-choice and anti-death penalty a pattern? But it is. I um, you know, I would just say, well, look, you know, if you have a choice between being anti-market or anti-left, libertarians are just really pro-market. So there's no way they can fit into the anti-market group. There are a lot of libertarians who try to just be nice to both sides, which I think is a very smart strategy. But in terms of how the other sides feel about you, 
Uh, you know, quite striking that no matter how many overtures libertarians have made to the left and how many left-wing causes libertarians have even funded, still, like, one, like some of the main people that the left hates are libertarian philanthropists, the Koch brothers, the amount of rage that has been, he and just dis uh, disgust that's been heaped on them. Number of times people have accused me of being insincere because I'm just taking money from the Koch brothers. You know, like, like that's, you know, you know, many, many times. Uh, whereas I'll say, you know, among right-wingers, unless they are the specifically devoted to a policy issue that they don't like me on, like immigration, you know, right-wingers are, like, are just much nicer to me overall. And this is just generally true. And, you know, if you go to Cato events, you'll see, look, you know, there'll be the occasional open-minded leftist, but just a lot more Republicans, a lot more right-wingers going there. If you look at, like, the Cato scorecard for, uh, for freedom uh, by, you know, by state, Republican states do way better. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, again, it does not mean that libertarians don't have a strong issue with a lot of parts of the right wing they do, but I would just say they are a particular subspecies of, uh, of the right, and that's where they sociologically belong, even if philosophically they might have you know, almost certainly do have a lot of complaints. Um, so at this point in history, it seems like the right are far more susceptible to conspiracy theories, and they're mm -hmm. all over the place. And the thing that the, what I can do when I two things I think lead me to say things are a conspiracy theory. One is when a person tends to buy into every single one, I say they're a conspiracy <laughs> theorist. Like if you just find one and you say, wow, the evidence is strong here, but they tend to buy into all of them. Yeah. And the other thing is they will not be falsified. And what I mean is I got into a debate the other day of a guy I've known for years and he posted on uh, Facebook that black black rock vanguard owns both dominion and fox so the whole lawsuit was a hoax so i looked into this and it turns out no they own like seven percent of fox and they own stock in a company called dominion that had nothing to do with the voting so i told him that he said well, where'd you get that i said well i googled it he said oh no no google's no good you can't use Google. You've got to go to DuckDuckGo. I said, okay. I went to DuckDuckGo and it said the exact same thing that I just found out on Google. And he said, no, no, you got to keep looking. And I told him, why do I have this feeling that you want me to keep looking until I find the one source that says what you want to believe? Mm -hmm. so is there a reason that that's taking place on the right and not so much on the left right now? I've got a story about... The whole world for the last 200 years i don't know enough about the tendency to conspiracy theorizing for or like over the whole world or for this period to say i don't have any sense that it's especially bad over the long run with the right wing so i would just think of this as a blip or something perhaps oh, it's anomalous yeah i mean like it doesn't mean that there isn't going to be that it won't be persistent for a while right i mean i would say it probably starts in the united states but then the united states is so and lar to, largely due to the internet has become even more culturally central than it used to be. So now right-wing movements all around the world tend to go and ape whatever is going on in the U.S. right-wing. Uh, so that would be my best story there. But uh, I mean, like, I, I guess I would say that there's some slight tendency based upon my story for this to make sense because and if you're left wing, if you're just complaining about markets, you don't need to go and find hidden agendas or, or secret things that are going on. You say, look at what's happening. There's these big businesses, there's corporations acting all corporation-y to uh, quote <laughs> Team America. And on the other hand, if you are just anti-left, this is one where, look, on the surface, they appear to be all caring and nice. But if you look more closely, these monstrous jerks are pedophiles, blah, blah, blah. So that's one where it kind of fits. But I'm not going to claim more than a token amount of confirmation from that because it wasn't true for a long time. So it's not true that it's like inherent to the logic or anything like that, such as it is. Now, but a theory, a good theory has to have broad explanatory power. Mm -hmm. And what I, when did you come up with this theory? I think I read it was in 2011, but I might be yeah, wrong. Yeah, there, yeah, thereabouts, about 10 years ago. I mean, it was sort of been like mulling in my mind for a few years, but then finally I decided to go and put it down. And to me, the idea perfectly explains the Trump phenomenon mm -hmm. because Trump is not philosophically or ideologically inclined at all. It's hard to know what, right. where he's going to stand on any issue. <laughs> but what he does is constantly bashes mm -hmm. the left in the yeah. left's perceived 
emissaries, mm-hmm. the mainstream media. Yeah, you just find out what's going to bother the most and I'll just do or say that. And the people love Trump for that. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter how much he lies, how dumb the things he says are. You can count on it him. It doesn't matter that he used to be a Democrat. Democrat. No, no. Yeah, it doesn't matter at all to, to them. So it seems like that's the that is explains that. So do you think that's accurate that your theory kind of would predict a Trump like figure to come about? Again, it's plausible, but I don't want to claim too much because then you have to ask me why hasn't the right always had Trump like figures? So, you know, well, that's it's, true. I, 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 it's, it's, it's helpful. And, you know, it seems kind of like the thing that I would suggest, but. I, I, you know, I don't want to I don't want to overclaim for the theory. I mean, really, like a lot of what I'm trying to do here is just give an alternative to a bunch of other stories that people act like explain things. And I'll say yours don't explain it at all. Mine explains a little bit anyway. You know, like there's a lot, like, a lot of people, especially leftists, when they first hear the story, say, why don't you say the left is anti-market and the right is pro-market? And that's where I say, yes, well, if you knew actual a reasonable swath of right-wingers, you would know the answer to that. There's plenty of anti-market right-wingers. Sure are. So that's, you know, so that one's wrong. Then there are ones, you know, like you might've heard of the survive, th- thrive theory that I talk, talk about in another chapter in the book. Uh, this is one that Scott Alexander has pushed, but I don't think he originated it. Just comes down to well, the left is for a society where survival is assured, and so you're just trying to thrive, and the right is for when you know, like survival's in jeopardy, and so you're just trying to go and make sure that you stay alive. And this is one where I say, look, this one just totally doesn't fit the facts. We can see that the most left, most radical left wing movements came in countries that were in severe poverty or on or like after revolution, so Soviet Union, Communist China. Right. Furthermore, I said we also see that. Normally, when survival of state countries move away from markets towards socialism, war socialism, standard, you know, famously in Germany during World War I. So, yeah, it just doesn't fit at all. I say this is really a case of just living in the Bay Area in the 2000s and saying this is what leftism means and saying, look, that's just one very tiny, vocal, currently temporarily prominent part of a giant coalition to go and treat people that are really into LGBTQ rights as being canonically leftists when most leftists throughout history wouldn't have any idea what you're talking about is weird, ridiculous. Okay. So you, you've mentioned a few times that the, your theory is long-term. It, it's not an, an immediate mm-hmm. thing and you don't want to claim too much for it. So mm-hmm. what's the beginning? Give me the beginning point where the left is anti-market. And then I want you to do the same mm-hmm. thing with the right, where the right starts to just hate hate the left and it's not just in this country i presume right these are oh, yeah. broad things that apply yeah. universally right so i say 200 years ago because i'm actually going back a little even a little bit earlier actually to the to the actual founding of the terms left and right which comes from the seating of parliamentarians in the french parliament during the french revolution and i'll say yeah that's where you start to see it so you've got the far left in the french revolution uh led by people like robespierre who are very quickly decapitating people. <laughs> and we're like, who are the main victims, actually? Main victims are merchants for breaking price control laws after they go and hyperinflate the currency. So this is, uh, you know, like, like a lot of people think of this as part of the Enlightenment. I, 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 those people, I will say, look, remember, there is one so-called Enlightenment figure that the radicals uh, in the French Revolution, like the people of Robespierre, that they go and elevate above all else, which is Rousseau who was seen throughout the entire Enlightenment world as being an anomalous figure who did not agree with the, with the rest of them. So you had your, your classic Enlightenment figure be someone like Voltaire, who is talking about freedom, human, you know, freedom, human rights, at least sympathetic to free trade. Right? And that was you know, like what you could say held the French and British Enlightenments together was uh, like in you know, democracy as well, but like a you know, moderate democracy, you know, constitutional democracy. All the things that you see are held in common by you know, John Locke, Voltaire, Montesquieu, David Hume. I'll even put Edmund Burke in there, actually. On the other hand, you have this one weird outlier, Rousseau, who has lots of complaining about inequality, lots of, you know, he'll, he'll talk, talking about how great Sparta was and his home capital of Geneva, known for its Calvinist <laughs> theocracy. Right. So this is the guy that is the found, that is the hero of the left in the French Revolution in France. And then who are the right? Pretty quickly, it's actually everybody who doesn't want to get their heads hacked off. 
right? So, you know, you like, you know, the Thermidorian reaction, this is really just combining a lot of people that don't like those radicals, right? And you know, so that's, I mean, I say the French Revolution really does fit with this. I think this is where, where you see the origin. You see the left going after markets to a quite high degree, like under the influence, you know, like for the, for the stand, by the standards of the time, under the influence of Rousseau. And then all the other people saying, like, who are these maniacs? Right. And then you're able to get a coalition between, you know, like your like your moderate French revolutionaries and the people who just don't want to see priests executed and, and like, like you know, moderate monarchists and all these people can come together and say, well, well, not that. I got to know, where would you put Lafayette? Yeah. You know, you know here's an important thing to remember is that uh, you know, despite what I'm saying, I like I am well aware that there that with, specifically within France, there are some people that are getting placed on the left that don't seem leftist at all. I mean, probably my favorite Frenchman of all time is Frederick Bastiat, who did sit on the left in the French Assembly. I know that, but being one of the most pro-market people in the world. Oh, but that was much later. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, but you know, in a way, like, like you, know, you would expect that things would be congealing more and more. And so while it's at the very beginning that someone might be misplaced, you think that by the 1840s, it would have sorted itself out. And I, I'm just going to honestly say, no, it hadn't. There's weird things going on still. And uh, but still, you know, it, ta- it takes a while for everything to congeal and coalesce. Uh, but the yeah, Lafayette, yeah, I, I, like, I'm not a big Lafayette expert, but I would think I would put him with Thomas Paine, who you might recall, he wound up doing jail time in, in the French Revolution, right? Because the Rousseauian fanatics that I, I would say he really has very little to do with are the ones who got in power. And then, yeah, if you're not with us, you're against us. Right. So I mean, really, you know, Thomas Paine, like definitely had like a few complaints about markets, but yeah, like overall, like you can, you know, like he's like, a, you know, like someone in the general Smithian camp, you just say, yeah, he had like a problem with like private ownership of land, which, you know, is a big exception, but still uh, it's not, you know, like, but the overall, like, you know, like he's nothing like a socialist. I, I got to ask about Bastiat. Where would you put him? In, in yeah. The you know, like, spectrum? Like, again, like, like he's like, you know, very like super proto-libertarian i would just say like he is libertarian by modern standards and so you know like while like while there's plenty of people on the french right that he has nothing in common with but he really has nothing in common with really anybody on the french left so like the right is a place where he clearly like where where it's not clear that he doesn't belong and the left is a place where he clearly doesn't belong so while he was sitting with the left i'd say yeah like you know he is part of the right, like you can just read his stuff and see he has tons of stuff against socialists and how terrible and wrong they are. You know, like he'll also go and, and complain about nationalists too. But you can see that for the, you know, the nationalists are rejecting some of what he's saying and the socialists are rejecting pretty much all of what he's saying. So what do you think causes the left's antipathy to markets? Because like you said, it's, it's mm. and, I, and I've seen this, it's there's just a dislike of market outcomes. Mm-hmm. If they just don't like it, they don't like, the idea that people get rich off of them. They don't like the idea of competition. What is it that causes that? Here's what I'm going to say. I think anti-market attitudes are basically part of human nature. I don't, that, that is harder to say why, but I'll say you, it's really, there's just no time or place on earth where you just go and read what people talk, say about markets and don't see a lot of complaining. What's special about leftism is it takes these very natural human attitudes and it turns them into a philosophy. And sort of weaponizes them. Whereas in earlier periods, a lot of complaining about markets, it's more like kvetching. It's more like, oh no. And then what leftism does is take the kvetching and say, well, look, don't just complain. Let's do something about it. You know, per Karl Marx, or actually, let's see, like, yeah, actually, it's Marx quoting, uh, quoting, quoting Feuerbach of, you know, previous philosophers only start to describe the world, the point, however, is to change it. And you could also say, yeah, confectioners have only sought to complain about the world. The point, however, is to perfect it. So I think that's a lot of what's going on. Now, as to why this is so human, I mean, I've heard stories about it, but I don't think there's any really great story. I mean, obviously, anything that seems very deeply rooted in human psychology, you want to go and have an evolutionary story for it. I mean, sort of the best that I've got, which, again, I'm not going to say is great, is that look, human beings evolve in very small primitive tribes based upon sharing. You know, you know, and you know, like so, like especially share, you know, sharing of like any big success, like you bring home a big animal, you don't just eat it yourself, you share it with the whole tribe. Right. And in this, and in this situation, um, you know, it's you know, it's not totally socialist, but it's pretty socialist. And it's one where uh, 
first of all, like, like, you, like you don't want to go against the group in the small tribe. You don't want to say, hey, it's my individual merit that won this. Anyone who wants a piece has to go and pay me. Uh, because in a very small tribe like that, people talk that way you get shoved off the cliff when they're not looking. You don't and, want uh, that. There's this great book by Helmut, Helmut Schack called Envy, Envy. On, on, on this theme. You, um, you preempted me, man. I was just going to yeah. ask you what role Envy plays and you bring yeah. up the book yeah. Envy. Loved yeah, it, by it, the it, way. It is a really good book and it, and it like based in you know, like very primitive societies. It doesn't. This isn't something that we have to wait around for modern division of labor or anything. It seems like it's pretty basic human beings to be envious of others. And, and especially I'd say that if there's someone who gets high status by being like the best hunter and he's tough and strong, masculine, you know, that guy... People can go and like, you know, a guy like that, you know, sometimes can just say like, I'm the boss and I'm the chief here, whatever I say goes. But for like the crafty nerdy guy who like designs a better spear to then go and try to go and say, everyone has to go and give me 10% of their earnings from now on. Cause I went and offered you a superior spear in primitive society. I think you're just going to get murdered if you <laughs> try doing that. So sort of the predecessors of what we think of as the businessman, like would have been vanishingly unpopular in primitive societies. So I think that's part of what's going on there. I mean, what's very striking actually is if you just go and read, for example, medieval criticism of the rich. Now who are actually by far the richest people in medieval times, just visibly, you just look at them and you know that how rich they are. Yeah. The who? royalty, I would guess. Royalty, yeah, yeah. They're the ones with palaces and everything yeah. else. But if you want to read medieval criticism of the rich, there's a lot of stuff about the rich, but they never mention monarchs with their palaces and parties and gowns. It's a good way to lose your head. The, not the merchants. The merchants who are obviously way poorer than those guys. But on the other hand, it's like, yeah, but who's going to murder you if you go and start pointing to him and as, as yeah. a rich sinner? Yeah, it's the king's going to murder you for that. Whereas the wealthy merchant, on the other hand, he might actually go and give you some money to assuage his guilt and try to buy you off. And then you like, even in the modern era, what, what amazes me is that the people often say, ah, like the true heart of the left is egalitarianism and the part of the right is being you know, like status, status approving or something like this. It's like, well, if this is true, how come there's so much more left-wing hate for Elon and Jeff Bezos than there is for the royal family of Saudi Arabia? It's like, those guys are like, in, in actual practical terms, they're way richer. They just sort of treat the country like their personal property. They didn't do anything to earn it. They just inherited the stuff. Why is it that you seem to be so much more resentful of people that, be, that were not born billionaires? They created billion dollar companies that, that they got their money, obviously, by giving people a lot of stuff they like versus this a tyrannical descendant of, a, of an army of terrorists from 200 years ago. Like, like, why do you have such different feelings? Every now and then there'll be the phony, oh, well, I can change Elon or Bezos, but I can't change the Saudi royal family. It's like, no. You're not You're changing all alone Bezos. by yourself. You just <laughs> hate Elon and Jeff a lot more than you hate the royal family of Saudi Arabia, obviously. Like, like you just won't shut up about them. But, you know, like, it's, so it's not like egalitarianism per se. It really is focused on the most philosophically defensible rich people in the world are the ones you don't like and the ones you dislike the most. I think, yeah, I think envy, I, I think that comes a, a long way toward explaining a lot of that stuff. It, it, people right, just don't envy, like, why not envy the Royal Saudi family? Like, well, well the, the, because they're not outperforming them. I think that they're, the comparison here is they're being outperformed by others. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and so it's like that the happens. fact that they earned it, that is actually makes it the problem. Yeah. <laughs> because they're taking away your excuse to them. I think Mises wrote about that in the anti-capitalist mentality about the idea that, somebody accomplishing something takes away your excuse for not accomplishing it. And yeah. I think people resent that they hate it. So you're yeah. uh, so a Stalinist, by the way, Stalinist apostate Whitaker chambers. Well, <laughs> I mean, he, he did a review of Mises anti-capitalistic mentality and he was just so angry about it. Like when I was a communist, I never felt envy towards anyone. <laughs> like, wow. I, I only yeah. know about his hostility toward Rand. I didn't know he had hostility. Yeah, toward yeah, Mises too. Look, look, look. Like, yeah, Whitaker Chambers, like basically every former Stalinist, like had a severe, had a serious personality issue, serious issue with just talking to other people in a decent manner. And also just like, like despite his incredible errors, you know, often wrong, but never in doubt, 
like classic Stalin, like ex Stalinist mentality. It's like, dude, you were a Stalinist. You were as wrong as a human being can be at the time when it was more <laughs> obvious than it could ever have been. So With catastrophic you consequences. Talk bad about anybody ever. And yet, it took them like five seconds before saying, oh, well, I'm not a Stalinist anymore, before they started acting like their new authority for their new view. Yeah, those guys, <laughs> give me a break. <laughs> so you are, are an economist. You studied markets for a, a living, and you obviously have done a lot of history. And knowing what you know, what is the, the future? Do, is there any room for optimism about the, the future of having a free society? Or are we just doomed to this left hates markets, the right hates the left, and they're just going to battle it out and government keeps growing with the debt? Hmm. What I'll say is I've got a little bit of optimism politically. I've got a lot of optimism economically. You know, economically, I'll say, look, the, you know, the, the free market economy has shown that it is robust enough to keep growing and keep giving people a better quality of life despite the bad stuff that modern democracies typically do, which is a lot. Modern democracies do have tons of bad policies, but they're not so bad to actually completely strangle progress. We've seen an enormous amount of progress despite tons of bad stuff happening. Uh, so I'm you know, optimist about economics, optimist about, you know, about you know, economic quality of life, optimist about technology, uh, but yeah, in terms of politics, I will say I, I you know, the closest thing I'll come to optimism is my view will just muddle through. There's a lot of historical precedent for muddling through. The like, if you just go and take a look and just try, try answer, answering this question, what is the richest country per capita that ever had a civil war you know, that killed, say, even 0.1 percent of the population of the country over 10 years? Uh, it's, it's, maybe, it's really hard to name that country, actually. Yeah. Maybe Great Britain with the Glorious Revolution. I yeah. don't know. Yeah, well, they, they were they were actually dirt poor still then. Like, like by modern were standards, they? they were like were like at the level of Chad or something. I think <laughs> they were like. So yeah, I mean, like you know, uh, so possibly you know, like you know, like you know, Spain in the 30s. Even then, they were really poor. Yeah, you know, so like what we see is that you know, like rich societies in general just basically seem to never have civil wars. It makes sense so, when you're comfortable. So, you know, you don't which, wanna, uh, oh, pardon? When you're comfortable, you don't want to be getting murdered yeah. out of your company. It's not really yeah. worth risking. Right. Right? You mean, of course, not wanting to be murdered isn't what saves you, but it's that <laughs> other people don't want to risk their lives. To yeah, too, people. yeah. That's the, that's where you really are, like, you know, the fact that you don't want to get murdered, well, nobody ever wants that. But the fact that you're just in a place where no one's really ready to go to the mattresses over much of anything, that's good. That keeps you safe. So I've got a lot of, you know, that gives me a lot of optimism. I do have a general pet theory, which is that you get the most horrible wars, World War I, World War II, essentially when you've got countries with modern economies, but pre-modern values, because they were, are basically the first or second generation to modernize. So that's my story about the world wars, is that you have countries that have the power to destroy other countries for the first time in human history. This just didn't exist before. But as long as the people are, are still had their values formed when life was cheap, they're actually likely to go and do high risk strategies to use them, which is what we saw in the world wars. But uh, once uh, like all the countries that have the power to do great harm have been rich for a couple of generations, then I think that the risk of not just civil war, but international war gets really low. So that's a kind of muted optimism of saying things aren't gonna get a lot worse. Uh, but yeah, but in terms of like the you know, policy getting better, see the main thing there I'll just say is the world's a big place, and so some places will be getting better, some will be getting worse, some states will be getting better. What about here, though, in America? Some states will be getting worse, and if you got some mobility, then like it's not terrible. Now, during COVID, I actually lived in Texas for three months to get away from horrible policies in Virginia. Lived in Florida for another five weeks to get rid of hor to get away from horrible policies. So you got some of that, um, but I mean, honestly. Uh, you know, I once actually, I think I, I, I yeah, at least it was on Twitter. I think I actually did and wrote a piece on it, right? This is called like the great political stagnation. What I said is, look, since the collapse of communism and post-communist reform, since say 1995, when that stuff basically petered out, what are the best political events that happened on earth? And it's pretty hard to come up with anything very good that happened on earth. <laughs> Maybe so on we Mars. Got, we got like about 30 years where, I just can't say that there was anything really good that happened. Even like that, you know, there's still some good things that happening, you know, but like a lot of great stuff, stuff happening economically, technologically. But I just can't honestly say that I, there's anything that happened politically 
that I think should make libertarians very happy during this time. You can, you, know, you can find something where you can narrow it down and say, ah, oh, well, in Portugal, this good thing happened, right? But if you're writing the history of, of human freedom, you know, say, okay, well, we found something in Portugal, <laughs> right? In other words, like, there's just not much good to say because we got to go all the way down into Portugal. <laughs> so you have a theory, you don't vote. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I like what you had to say about it. What, what, so tell us, what's the reason that you don't vote? Right. Uh, this is not something original to me. I'm heavily cribbing from Jason Brennan's uh, book, The Ethics of Voting. Uh, but it comes down to this. First of all, um, voting is an act of philanthropy. It's not one where any reasonable person thinks they'll actually change the outcome. The only reason that it would make sense for you to do it would be to say, it's not just about me, it's about the world. So when I multiply the tiny chance to make a difference times the 8 billion people I will help, then maybe it's going to be a good Easter time. So that step one is just to say it can only make sense as a matter of philanthropy. And then step two is to say, is that really the best philanthropic thing that you can think of doing? Right? What, you know, wouldn't it make more sense for you to go and take the time that you would spend on this and just work a bit more and then give it to war orphans or something like that? Wouldn't that actually be a lot more likely to make a difference? Um, now, if you know, like, basically what I'll say is that under the most favorable circumstances where like you happen to be in a swing state, that happens to be crucial for changing the outcome of the national election, and you have, and you know that you're extremely well informed, and it's going to be a really crucial election. There's a big difference between the two candidates. Then this is a case where I'll say, okay, that then maybe it would make sense to vote. But otherwise, I'll say that there you almost certainly have better philanthropy to be doing, and so I would focus on that instead. Uh, this is not just the simple economists. It's not good for me personally, so I'm not going to do it. That's pretty obvious, but it's also kind of a cop out because it's like, well, don't you care about other people on earth, right? But if you live in California, it just is crazy to think you're gonna change the, the, like, how, the, like how California votes, it's just too lopsided. So like, you know, if you are in California, it makes a lot more sense to go and just take the time you would put into politics, regardless which side you're on, obviously. It doesn't matter what, which side you believe in, you'll say, look, the election is determined. It's overwhelmingly left-wing here, so there's no way I'll change it. So I'm going to take the time I would have spent on politics and spend it on working, you know, like working more and then giving the money to combat malaria or deworming pills or something like that. All right. Thank you. So before I let you go, I need to know what, what's your latest book? Where can people find it? Where can people find you? Great. Uh, yeah. So my latest book is called Voters as Bad Scientists, uh, Essays on Political Rationality. Uh, this is actually the fourth in a series of books of my best all-time blog essays. I blog for Econ Log from 2005 to 2022, about thousands of pieces. So what I've done is I picked out about the top 6% of things that I wrote, and I'm turning them to eight different books based upon the theme. The theme of this one is Essays on Voter Irrationality. The uh, title of the book, Voters as a Mad Scientist, comes from the title essay, where I say a lot of people think of Bad, bad voting is being driven by self-interest. They say, no, it's not that. I mean, uh, really what's going on is that people are voting the way they're doing because they think that they're helping the world, helping their society. The problem is that they think about the actual efficacy of their policies pretty much zero. And so it's a lot, you know, being in a democracy is a lot like waking up strapped to an experimenter's table. And the mad scientist says, I'm here to perfect you. And he's like, I don't want to be. He's like, don't worry. I don't want any money. I mean, <laughs> takes out his weird devices and starts turning it. And you're like, I mean, and like, if only this guy were greedy, I'd get out of here alive. <laughs> because then he'd say, I won't give you my wonder treatment unless you pay. Like, no, thanks. Like, fine. You don't want it. You don't get it. And you're OK. But what really happens in democracy is that people that are intellectually totally irresponsible, who put almost no thought into their grand schemes for how to go and make the world a better place are determined to make the world a better place, whether you like it or not. And then innocent people like you and me especially get caught in the crossfire. Closely related to a long running argument I've had with my colleague, Pete Betke, where he says, you know, Brian, according to you, we get the policies we deserve. I say, no, Pete, according to me, we get the policies they deserve. <laughs> very different yeah, that's right? a good the one the fact that we have put a lot of thought into this in no way saves us people voted against hitler died from the bombings uh, of the allies just as much as people that yeah. voted for him 
didn't change the outcome for you because it's, you know, it's a winner take all system uh, that, you know, it's a uh, sad, but true. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's one of four books of essays. Uh, there's going to be four more actually. Uh, so uh, collect them all. They're all only 12 bucks each. I haven't raised the price despite massive inflation. Uh, all of them on Amazon, $9.99 for the eBooks. I also have some much more famous books. I am a New York Times bestseller. So my New York Times bestselling book is Open Borders, The Science and Ethics of Immigration, which I hope that all rationalists will know and love. And it's one where I try to make rational thought about a highly emotional issue more emotionally appealing by using the nonfiction graphic novel format. Uh, so if you are curious, what would that even look like? Take a look. I feel really good about it. I'm also the author of The Myth of the Rational Voter, Selfish Reasons to have more, more Kids, The Case Against Education. And I'm working on uh, two new books right now. I'm working on a nonfiction graphic novel on housing deregulation, which uh, is another issue that all rationalists should be really jazzed up about, or I will try to convince you to be so. And then last, I'm working on a new book called Unbeatable, The Brutally Honest Case for Free Markets, which rationalists should just totally love because it's all about the problem is that the intellectually best case for markets is emotionally unappealing, and we've just got to go and set emotion aside and listen to the cool voice of reason. Uh, I blog for on Substack for Bet On It, so every day I'm doing no essays there, and I've also got my website, bkaplan.com. Uh, so that's uh, pretty much everything I am and have done. All right. Well, Professor Kaplan, thank you very much for being here. I hope to have you on again sometime because those are some good right. topics you just brought up. All right. All right. All right. My, my pleasure. My All pleasure. Right. For now, I'm Michael Leibowitz. This is The Rational Egoist signing off. Remember, like, share, subscribe, and comment. Till next time.